coming. Today's topic is a healthy shopping list. And it's a continuation of last month's topic where we talked about health, healthy eating's golden equation. And does anybody remember what the three components of the healthy eating golden, golden equation was? Nutrition, calories, and fiber. Fiber. Yeah, fiber. fiber. So yeah. calories are necessary because that's what we need as an energy source to just live. Um, nutrition we need because that maintains the body. And then fiber we need because that cleans our digestive system. And it helps absorption of nutrients, so it's, it's also important. So those are the three factors. And now that we understand those three factors and know by those three factors what healthy food is and what it's not, now we're gonna actually go to the supermarket and take a look at how we build a healthy shopping list, what things we should buy or not buy. So, first I wanted to just make a list of why we should eat healthy. Is it just because it's a fad or because the FDA is now telling us that we should eat healthy or because we know we should and we feel guilty every time we eat chocolate? Well, here are some very, very direct reasons why we should eat healthy. It's for ourselves. So, we lose weight. Most of us at some point in our lives have been overweight. So, losing weight equals better health. It equals more possibility to move around and to do the activities and to, you know, have more energy. So, losing weight is a good reason why we should eat healthy. Increase energy. Who has felt at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a weekday this drowsiness after lunch? All of us. It's not, it's not the natural way. It doesn't have to be that way. You know little children, they're full of energy. They never stop. They don't get that 2 o'clock drowsiness. Well, we shouldn't have to either. So we can increase our energy levels throughout the entire day, all week, all month, by eating healthy. That's another good reason to eat healthy. Healthy skin, hair, and nails. That's what's on the outside of our body. And by eating healthy, by getting enough healthy oils and other nutrition, we maintain healthy skin. Skin, by the way, is the number one factor how you can determine age. If somebody walks up to me and says, guess my age, I'm not gonna look at their hair, I'm not going to look at how big or strong or anything. I'm going to look at their skin, because the skin never lies. Of course, the skin can be worse than your age if you, say, have smoked 20 years. Well, maybe you're 40 and your skin looks like if you were 50. So there's ways to make it worse. But it's never, no matter how well you take care of your skin, your skin ages, you know. What's, what's so, so, so beautiful about babies is that their skin is perfect. It smells so wonderful, it's so soft, it's just magical. And as we age, then our skin loses some of those qualities, but you know, it's always, it should remain healthy and vibrant. So healthy skin, same thing with hair, same thing with nails. Reduce or eliminate allergies. I don't know if any of you have any allergies or have had any allergies or have had any kind of outbreaks, not necessarily an allergy say, per se, but maybe a rash or you know acne on the, on the face or whatever. So if, you, if we eat healthy, all of these things can be eliminated. Allergies are, again, not something that is normal and natural to everybody. Everybody has allergies. No, that's not true. Allergies are something that is because of a lack of health. 
So by eating healthy, we can reduce or eliminate allergies. Eliminate the common cold. I read a book about five years ago, which was called Never Be Sick Again. And I thought, don't believe it. Too good to be true. So he wasn't talking about being sick in general. Of course, you can never control or predict that. He was talking about the common cold. He was talking about that flu that comes once a month, once a year that a huge number of our population get, or you know when you're stressed, then at the end of that stressful month you get this cold, you know, cough that lingers for a week or two or three. You know, if you work in a place with lots of other people or children, you know, children are sick a lot, then it's easy to pick up a cold from a child, and then you've got you're sneezing, you've got the sniffles for a week, and then your body gets better. This common cold is again not natural. If our immune system is strong and healthy and our body is full of nutrition, we don't have to get the flu every year. We don't have to get these common colds a couple times a year. And when I read that book, I didn't really believe it, I didn't fully understand what he was talking about, but the more I learned about nutrition, the more I understood. Um, and now, I'm at the point in my life where I never get sick. I used to get a cold twice a year, always in December, because I ate a lot of sweets in December that weakened my immune system. Not, not only December, but starting from Thanksgiving until the New Year, I was eating cookies and candies and chocolates like crazy. I was suppressing my immune system. Other people were sick. Of course I was going to get sick. And then I would usually get sick sometime in March. And now I never get sick. I don't get that common cold. I never get the flu. It's because I eat healthy. So we can eliminate the common cold. Improve and stabilize digestion. Digestion too is something that should be regular and normal. Having bad digestion or diarrhea on a regular basis or constipation, these things are not normal. We shouldn't have to experience that. If we eat healthy, you'll see that your digestive system begins to stabilize. So much so, if you eat healthy, that you can predict exactly when you're going to go to the bathroom. So we can improve and stabilize digestion, improve sleep. I heard somebody walk in here and talk about not being able to sleep. One of the factors that is very, very important in sleep is what we're eating. So do we drink a lot of coffee? Of course that's gonna affect our sleep. Or, and not only coffee, but other sources of caffeine. Alcohol, sugar, processed foods, all of those things will affect our sleep. Of course there's other factors, stress, you know, whether we exercise or not, but eating is certainly one of the very important factors in controlling our sleep. So by eating healthy, we're also improving sleep. Decrease inflammation. Inflammation is a natural process of the body in order to heal something that is wrong. Our bodies are constantly in stages of inflammation. So if I am around the child and the child sneezes on me and you know I wipe my face, but then eventually I get a lot of mucus in my nose and I start getting a headache. That headache and that mucus is my body trying to trap this cold that the child had that got into me and get rid of it before it takes over my system. And so inflammation is a natural process, but then when the body gets rid of what it needs to and it's healing, then the, the, the inflammation needs to go away. So if we break our ankle, or not even break it, just twist our ankle, what's the first thing the body does? It sends lots of liquid there, it blows it up, there's extra circulation. It's just the process of healing something that is wrong. So inflammation, both inflammation that we see externally, but also internal inflammation, um, you know, our digestive system can be inflamed, our 
all of our system can at some point be inflamed. So by eating healthy, we help decrease inflammation. And one of the most important things for inflammation is drinking a lot of water. The body needs to be able to cleanse all of this stuff that is trying to heal out. Reduce or el eliminate food cravings. Now, I'm not trying to say that food cravings are bad. And I do believe in the wisdom of our body telling us what we need. When I get sick, I crave chicken noodle soup. Part of that is because when I, was, I would get sick as a child, that's what my mom would make me. But part of it, I'm sure, is that there are certain things in simple noodle soup that are good for my body, and my body is craving that. So food cravings can be good, but when they control us, when I have that chocolate craving and I can't think or I'm feeling drowsy and I'm thinking, oh, it would be so yummy with the cookie right now. That's not a normal craving. And it's okay to have it, but if it's a constant thing, if it's, con you know, if it's uh, tiring me or controlling me in any way, then we don't want to have it. We want to be able to eat what we want to eat when we want to eat. We want to have this craving controlling me. So we can reduce or eliminate food cravings. Reduce or eliminate medications. Medications are meant as a temporary aid to help you heal. I don't believe that anybody should be taking medications for the rest of your life. Now there are certain conditions that will require that possibly, but I don't believe that. I believe that you go to the doctor, you have a certain condition, you take a medication for a month, six months, a year, two years, you know, during that process when your body can recover enough to heal itself again. So, but this idea that, you know, my mother takes 12 medications every single day for the rest of her life, I think there's something wrong. She doesn't eat healthy. I think if she made choices and ate healthy, she wouldn't have to take those 12 medications every day for the rest of her life. So we can reduce or eliminate medications, improve focus and attention, our mental state. When we get that drowsy feeling at two o'clock in the afternoon, we are impairing our awareness, our mental state, our focus. We can't focus because We've got this blood sugar imbalance because we ate a lot of pasta at lunch. And so of course our body's craving sugar so that it can get energy again. None of that is natural. If we eat right, we're gonna improve focus and attention. Improving emotional balance. What we eat also affects our emotional state. I know it firsthand. If I am hungry, I get in a bad mood. That's it. If I am hungry, I get in a bad mood. My girlfriend knows that. So she's like, you're hungry, let's feed you. <laughs> so, but it affects our emotion, absolutely. If we eat healthy and our body has regular cycles and knows what to predict, then our emotions are also more balanced because our emotions are very much controlled by the chemical reactions going on in our body. So if we eat healthy, we improve overall health and maintain it long term. And that's really the reason, the main reason to eat healthy is to improve overall health and maintain it long term. We're all very, very different. Some of us are young, some are older, some are tall, some are short. No matter where you are, the idea is to improve your health and then to maintain that health that you do have over a long period of time. And that is possible by eating healthy. So those are the reasons why we should be eating healthy. So this is the equation that we looked at last month. Eating healthy is a combination of nutrients. We should have a lot of them. Calories, we need them for energy and fiber, which are important for absorbing calories for our system to get the stuff it needs, but also keep keeping our digestive system clean. So those are the three factors. And now let's take a look at how those three items 
look in our supermarket. So calories. Calories are in almost everything, except zero Coke. <laughs> so we don't have to really worry about calories. There's no scarcity of calories. When we walk into the supermarket, we don't have to think, I need to get myself some calories. Because almost anything you pick up is going to be full of calories. So they require no special attention. So the calorie part, we can put it aside. We know that if we fill our basket, we're going to get plenty of them. The nutrients. Here we have an important consideration that will help steer our choices. In the supermarket, there are some items that have tremendous nutrition that are very, very good for our health. And then there are some items that have no nutrition. They taste yummy, they look good, but they don't really give our body anything as far as nutrition is concerned. So this is going to be, nutrition is going to be an important factor to help us choose things in the supermarket. Fiber. Fiber marks a clear distinction between things that are natural and things that are processed. Basically, processed food, what they're doing is they're refining it. They're getting rid of all the fiber to enrich it, to make it taste better, to give it more calories so that it can sit on the shelf for a long time. If something has fiber, it's going to rot naturally over time. If something doesn't have fiber, it can sit on the shelf for 12 months, 16 months, 24 months, or longer. So fiber is also going to be one of these key things, nutrients and fibers, that will help us decide what is good for our bodies and what's not. So the layout of a modern supermarket. There is a science behind this. Just like if you go to Las Vegas in the casino, people have studied this and invested millions of dollars trying to figure out when you walk into the supermarket, what are you going to do? And how can we get you to buy this product and not that product? So basically, let's imagine this TV screen is a supermarket and the door here is this Samsung brand brandy here. So I walk here to the supermarket and I walk in and here is the supermarket layout. Basically, everything in the middle is processed stuff that we basically don't want. There's some exceptions, but basically everything in the middle we don't want. Whereas things along the outer edges of the supermarket we do want. And why is that? There's two main reasons. Number one, there's a practical reason. Shop along the outer walls. Why? Items that have a short shelf life, that are rich in fiber, require special equipment to maintain it. Refrigeration, mist sprayers, ovens, etc. So if you're building a supermarket, you don't want to put an oven right here in the middle. Why? Because it's dangerous for the customers. You don't want to have refrigerators spread out. Why? Because then you have to have a bunch of electrical cords going in. Whereas if you neatly put all of the heavy duty equipment on the outside, you can mask all of the stuff that it requires, the electricity and the, it's big stuff. So that's why they put it on the outside. It's just a practical purpose. Whereas just shelves of stuff that can sit there for months, yeah, let's just fill the whole middle part with shelves and just put all of the bread and peanut butter and popcorn and chocolate bars and they can sit there for days and months and years. The other reason, is they put the unprocessed foods, so our vegetables, our fruits, our dairy, the meats, as far away from the entrance as possible. Why? because manufacturers of processed food are paying a price for premium product placement. When I walk in here, whatever is right here, that company has spent thousands of dollars giving Publix money so that they can have their product right there. That's how the supermarket works. 
we are a target audience. They want our money. They're not interested in our health. They're interested in our dollars. So the product that is here has paid less money than the product that is here. The product that is way up there, chances are they don't pay Publix anything to put it there, or Whole Foods, or but I see that there, whatever. So the unprocessed food tends to be far, far, far from the entrance because you don't have farmers saying, put cucumbers right at the front, we'll pay you money. No, cucumbers are cucumbers, they grow them, they put them on the supermarket, people buy them. Whereas Hershey bars and marshmallows and Diet Coke, they pay the supermarket to have it right there in front of your face. Not only that, but what do you see at the checkout counter? Yep, yeah, those companies are pre paying premium price to have their chocolate bars right there. So that after you've bought your, your thing, you don't forget that chocolate bar on the way out. So, so there's a lot of science in here. It's not just coincidence. But that's good because it makes us aware, okay, there's a certain strategy that they use. Well, I have to have a strategy too. I'll walk in the supermarket. I'll walk this way. Walk around. Check out. And I'm gone. All of this stuff in the middle is not interesting to me. Okay. So now when we're going to build a shopping list, what we need to buy when we go to the supermarket, let's be realistic. Let's be practical about where we are today. Because if I took myself as an example and I, I went back 10 years and I thought what my shopping looked like 10 years ago and I said, okay, Andres, you have to change from what your shopping list is now, 10 years ago, to what it is today. The Andres from 10 years ago would have gone, I don't think so. <laughs> That's not going to work for me. So we have to accept that healthy change takes time. So at first, maybe there's some vegetables that you've never tried, that you don't know how to cook, that you're not familiar with, maybe even that you don't like, and that's okay. You have to trust the wisdom of your body. But slowly but surely, we need to just make small, comfortable changes, one step at a time. And eventually, over 10 years' time, my diet has transformed tremendously from what I used to buy at the supermarket to what I buy in the supermarket today. So let's take a minute. Everybody has a pad of paper. I want you to write a list of the 10 most common grocery store items that you buy. So, and of course, it doesn't have to be exact, but just think through, you know, like every time I go to the grocery store, I always buy these three things. I always buy milk, I always buy fish, I always buy a chocolate bar. Whatever you want. Try to think of the th 10 things that are common on your shopping list. Three lists. So what are these long-term goals? If we hope to change our grocery list over time, what are these goals that we don't expect to maybe change our grocery list altogether, but over time, in a year's time, five years' time, 10 years' time, what kind of changes would we like to see? Well, obviously, we want to drink more water. So if you're somebody who drinks Gatorade all the time or Diet Coke or whatever, you know, water is the thing that our body most needs. So the more water you can drink, the better. There is, there is a sickness of over drinking water, but that's very, very extreme. Most of us don't have to worry about that. We want to eat less. So of course, this applies mostly to after we've finished our puberty. So when we're 20 years old or 24 years old maybe and our body has fully developed, then our diet should change and we don't need as much. As we're growing, 
So children, teenagers, young adults do need a lot of nutrition and food because their body is growing, is shaping a lot. But after that age, 24, 25, 26, whatever, then we don't need as much. So we should really try to eat less. And I think especially in a society like ours, we overeat all the time. It's not just Thanksgiving and Christmas. We overeat all the time. It happens to me every single day. I go to a restaurant with some friends, they bring me a dish. It's way too much food, but it's so delicious, I want to finish it. And I walk away from that restaurant feeling that I've overeaten, that it was too much, that I didn't really need all of that food. So one of our goals should be that we should eat less on a regular basis that we should eat more varied. So maybe there are fruits and vegetables that you've never tried. Star fruit. You know, before I lived in Miami, I hadn't seen it. It wasn't so common. So I saw it one day and I thought, I'm going to try this. And I tried it and it's delicious. Now it's part of my diet. Because star fruit has some nutrition that other things won't have. So the more varied I eat, the more I'm covering all of my bases to getting full nutrition. So one of our long-term goals should be that we eat more varied. That we eat mostly greens. So Michael Pollan, who wrote a book called Om uh, Omnivore Dilemma, it's called In Defense of Food. He has three basic... Uh, pillars for what healthy eating is. He says, eat less, mostly greens, uh, what's the third one? Oh no, okay, the first one is eat food, because he defines that all of this stuff in the middle of the supermarket isn't necessarily food. So he starts off by saying, eat food, mostly greens, not so much. So, there we see, eat mostly greens. Greens, vegetables that are green, spinach, kale, broccoli, zucchini, collard greens, the tops of carrots, all of the stuff that is green is green for a reason. It's jam-packed with nutrition. That's the healthiest stuff you can eat. Seaweed from the ocean is super healthy. So all things that are green, eat it. And I'm not talking about green glazed cookies <laughs> at Christmas time, the tree ones. So eat mostly greens. Eat plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables. That should be a long-term goal. Maybe you eat a lot of fruits already, but not so many vegetables. Well, our long-term goal should be to eat more fruits and more vegetables. Reduce sugar. We are in a society which puts sugar in everything. And we, we need to be aware of that and we need to try to reduce it. If you have coffee every single day with two scoops of sugar in it, try to reduce it. Have one scoop and a half in your coffee. And over time, it'll taste the same to you. And then reduce it to one scoop of sugar. And then half. Eventually, your body gets accustomed to anything. Just realize that we're consuming a lot of excess sugar. So the more we can reduce sugar in our system, the healthier we're eating. Reduce processed foods. And that's not only foods, but drinks. And that's all the stuff that's in the supermarket. Bread, which we think of as one of the sources of life, the most basic foods. Bread is a processed food. Because they've taken flour, the original grain, and they've mushed it up and they've gotten rid of all of the fiber and nutrition and all they want is that fine little white powder which is basically the sugar that is in the grain and then we use that fine powder to make a dough which rises and rounds beautifully and then we eat it we are eating processed foods we're basically taking only the sugar bit from these grains that are full of nutrition and creating bread. I'm not saying bread is bad, but I'm saying it is a processed food. 
and we need to try to reduce that. We need to be eating mostly fruits and vegetables. <clears throat> so reduce processed foods, reduce toxins. When people ask me, do you eat mostly organic, all organic? It's a balance because organic food can sometimes be very, very expensive. I can't buy everything organic all the time. There are some things that you can't even find organic sometimes. So when I feel that it fits my budget, it fits my lifestyle, it fits where I'm shopping, of course I try to buy organic. But I don't buy everything organic. So there is a danger that maybe I'm buying apples that have been sprayed with pesticides. And so if I eat the apple, I'm getting those toxins. Well, I can reduce that by peeling the apple. And fortunately, the apple core is very, very, the skin is very, very strong and hard and thick. So the toxins will be caught there. So if I peel it, then I'm not getting those toxins. We should try to reduce toxins. And if that means start buying more organic, then that's what you should do. If that means peeling your fruits, then maybe that's what you need to do. Isn't there a lot of vitamins in the apple skin? Yes, there are. Which is why it's better to buy organic fruit and eat it with the skin. Absolutely. But it's a fine balance. Like, okay, I'm not getting some of those nutritions, but I'm getting toxins. So, you know, there's no right and wrong, absolutely. And we're all different. So maybe you need more fruit skin than I do. Or, you know, listen to your body. Don't, don't listen to what I say and do what I say and eat the way I tell you to. Listen to your body. And then the last thing we're trying to do is when we splurge, we should choose healthier options. We do eat to celebrate. Sometimes I will eat chocolate cake and I will have a glass of wine and I will, you know, put two scoops of sugar in my coffee. But I do that on special occasions. And when I do, I should try to make healthier choices. So if I have the choice of two chocolate cakes, well, which one has more preservatives and bad stuff for me? And which one is made by a baker who cares, who's chosen high quality eggs and flour? I should choose that one. So when we do splurge, we should ch try to choose healthier options. So these are all of the long-term goals. So we need to commit to change for the long haul. It's not about, okay, I'm gonna stop eating all of this junk food and I'm gonna be a perfect eater because in three days time, you're gonna be sick and tired of that and you'll quit. That's why diets in general don't work. We have a willpower and it has a certain amount of energy, but eventually it peters out. We need to think of change as a long-term thing. We have to accept where we are here and now. What you eat today on a daily basis is probably very different from what I eat today on a daily basis. So the step that you need to take to make that first change it's going to be different from the step I take to make that change in my diet today. So you have to accept where you are here and now. How many times do you go to a fast food restaurant a week? Maybe it's four. That's fine. Accept where you are here and now. Okay, four times a week I'm making a bad choice of going to a fast food restaurant. Let me tell you, fast food restaurants, most of that food is processed. It's not good for us. They do have salads, that's good for us. They do have fruit, that's good for us. But most of the burgers and fries and all of these yummy things, they're not good for us. So accept where you are here and now. Make your own personal evaluation. Find the level of change that is comfortable. It's not about going from being somebody who grills every Sunday to not eating meat at all. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying let's make small, comfortable changes. So instead of having 16 ounces of steak and a potato as your vegetable, have maybe 12 ounces of steak, a potato, 
and some broccoli or Brussels sprouts or asparagus. Find a vegetable that you do like and incorporate it into what you're currently eating. So those are the small changes that need to feel comfortable. Because in a year's time, you're going to be comfortable with that broccoli. And 12 ounces is all of a sudden going to feel like enough. And you actually maybe feel like 12 ounces is really a big portion. Maybe I should do eight. And instead of just broccoli, I'm going to have some other colors on my plate. I'll take and grill some yellow and red bell pepper. That's really yummy with steak. And then take further steps when you feel ready. So once you've accommodated one change, then the next step is going to feel not so distant and comfortable. And slowly but surely start making those changes. We have to be patient with ourselves. It's not about guilting ourselves into eating healthy. It's about understanding that the benefits of eating healthy are so tremendous that we deserve it. So take a look at your lists. And I don't want you to revamp your entire list. I want you to choose one item that maybe should be replaced and just cross it out. Just choose one thing that you think Okay, that's maybe not so good. It's yummy. I love it. But I'm going to cross it out. And where you crossed it out, maybe write in an item that you think maybe you should start regularly getting when you go to the grocery store. Maybe a banana. Maybe some strawberries. Spinach. Maybe spinach. Just think, what is an item I usually don't get that maybe I should start getting? That I'm familiar with, that I like, that I just don't get it because I don't know. I don't know why I don't get it. Go ahead and write that in, in instead. That's all I'm asking you to do. That's the level of change that we need to do on a small basis. So go and buy all of the things that you're buying right now, but just change out one item and make your, health, your diet just a little bit healthier. Still comfortable, still enjoyable, still practical, but just a little bit healthier. And little by little, this way, we're going to make see great changes. So that's it. That's how we make a healthy shopping list. It's not about transforming everything. This is what you should eat because it's different for everybody. It's important that we're realistic. This is what I eat. How can I make that just a little healthier? And then the next day, just a little healthier. And over time, you're gonna see huge changes. So I wanted to talk about just a couple things before I finish, because we don't always get our food from the grocery store. Sometimes we get it from the gas station, <laughs> or from a restaurant, or we go over to a friend's house, and they've invited us to dinner. So first, I want to just address the danger of eating out. The problem with eating out, or I'll start with the great thing of eating out. The great thing about eating out is that I don't have to do the dishes. That's the number one reason I eat out. But the dangers are you have no real control over what is in your food. I've worked in many restaurants. I've been in the kitchen and seen what they do. The restaurant is not interested in your health, guaranteed. Even if they paint healthy, green, fresh on their logo, they're not interested in your health. They're interested in your money. And because of that, they're putting extra fat, extra salt, extra sugar in your food. Why? Because we as humans crave that. So I know it as a chef. I can serve you a dish which is super yummy. If I add some butter, it's going to be yummy-er, guaranteed. But it's not necessarily healthy. So we have no real control, and I'm not saying don't eat out, but if you eat out every single day, that's maybe your first change. That you should eat out six days a week, that on that seventh day, you should buy something in the grocery store and learn how to prepare it. So the other thing is, know your dangers. 
and we all have different dangers. Maybe my danger is in the afternoon because of habit or tradition, I always used to have a cookie. And so that danger is that I will crave a cookie in the afternoon because I ate one for many years. And so it's just in my system. Okay, well, I know that danger. So what do I do to combat it? Maybe at three o'clock before that craving hits, I'll eat a pear so that my body, body feels a little bit fuller, feels nourished. And then when I think, oh, a cookie would be yummy, I would think, yeah, of course it would be yummy, but I just had a pear. I don't need a cookie. So we need to know our dangers. Another danger I had is Thanksgiving. I would go to Thanksgiving and I would always overeat. And last year for the first time, I went to a Thanksgiving dinner and I did not overeat. And how did I accomplish that huge task, that huge goal for myself? I prepared. I went with the mental state that I am going to overeat in this situation. I don't like that. I don't like how I feel the next day. I know it's not good for my body. I love all of this food, but I don't have to take it all in just tonight. So I went, I served myself one plate, I didn't go back for seconds, and I had one dessert. And the day after I felt great. Not only that, I was very proud of myself. But I know my dangers, I prepare and then I practice. It took me three Thanksgivings of doing this mental preparation to finally get there. The first two times I attempted it, I overate anyway. So practice makes perfect. How about frozen foods? Frozen foods are usually in the center of the supermarket. Well, they are processed in that the vegetables have maybe been chopped or peeled, frozen, thrown in a bag, so they are slightly processed. It doesn't mean that they aren't good for us, that they don't have nutrition. Frozen berries are less nutritious than fresh berries. But frozen berries are still good for us. So eat out of the frozen section as long as you're eating raw ingredients. You know, if it's just a bag of frozen spinach, that's good for you. If it's a bag of frozen peas and carrots, that's good for you. If it's bags of frozen berries, that's good for you. If you're getting a TV dinner that has sliced turkey and sauce and mashed potatoes, that's not necessarily good for you. Because that's more processed. How about the microwave? A lot of people are, you know, complaining about microwave and, you know, is the, having the cell phone good next to our ears all day long. The truth is we don't fully know. There's a lot of research that's been done and there's a lot of research that still needs to be done. Am I against the microwave? Not necessarily. If I go over to a friend's house and he warms up some tea for me in the microwave. Am I gonna drink it? Yes, of course I'm gonna drink it. I don't have a microwave. I never use a microwave in my house. But I prioritize time for cooking, so I, I can wait for the pot to boil five minutes. Maybe you don't have that time or haven't made that priority, and that's okay. If you wanna warm up the water in the microwave, do it. At least you're drinking water. You're making tea that's healthy for you not just guzzling down super processed who knows what. So, you know, I think if you want to use a microwave, use a microwave. I don't think it's a make or break kind of situation. So I'm going to show you my current shopping list. This is what a shopping list looks like for me today. I'm just putting myself on the spot so that you understand what an example is. But sometimes it's hard to like, okay, how do I compare to other people? And it's not about comparing, but... So, these two things I used to never buy. I used to never really buy greens. The problem I had with greens was they rotted very quickly. And so I would buy a bag of spinach and it would sit there for four or five days before I had time to think, like, what am I going to do with spinach? And then it would rot and I'd throw it away and I'd think, 
why did I buy that spinach? And so then I wouldn't buy spinach. But now, I eat it every single day, so it doesn't rot. And I can't get enough of it. Literally, I buy a box of greens, arugula or spinach that's that big. People come over to my house, open up my fridge, and they say, why are you having a party? I say, no, no, that is for me. I'm gonna be through that box in six days. I love greens. And it's, I'm not saying that that's the healthy way to eat, and that's, you know, one of the things my mom did right was that she forbade me to eat salads when I was young. Because in Colombia, you're not sure if the water they're using to grow the salads is healthy or not. So she was, you know, trying to take care of me. But I, that created in me this craving for salads that is so big that now I eat lots of greens. Onions and garlics, super healthy. Carrots, cabbage, broccoli, tomatoes, lots of vegetables. Avocado, wonderful source of oils. Nuts, same thing, wonderful source of oils. Nuts, by the way, and spices, you're also going to find in this part of the supermarket. Are they not healthy because they can sit on the shelf? Well, there are things that are super healthy that can sit on a shelf for a long time. Spices, for example. Nuts, for example. Just the way that nature has created them. They don't need all of this refrigeration or warming or heating, whatever. So there are things you'll find in the middle that are good for us. Cheese. I don't eat a lot of cheese, but sometimes a slice of cheese on a piece of bread is super. If I need something fast, if I'm running out the door, that's why I have the cheese. Olive oil, because I use that for all of my cooking. Almond milk. I'm not a milk drinker so much. Uh, my girlfriend is. And so she switched from regular milk to soy milk first, and now to almond milk. Um, and I. I think it's good. I, I never drink milk, but if I'm going to have something, I'll have all of Dark chocolate. That's my treat to myself. And then tortilla chips and salsa. That is the processed food that I eat. And I'm okay with that because the list is pretty good. And I don't even eat this every day. I will maybe have a little bit of chips and salsa twice a week when I'm really craving it. Eventually, I think in five years, this will be off my list. I won't need that anymore. But I accept that I'm in this transition, that I still really like that, I still really crave it. What brand? <laughs> I, get the, I get the green, uh, the blue corn tortilla chips that are made with organic blue corn. Um, and salsa, it will vary, it depends. I've always really liked peace. But capsaicin is supposed to be good for you. What? Yes, absolutely. That's very good for me. Mexican, but, so I eat a lot of but the salsa would be healthier if I made it at home oh, I make it and not bought it in a jar. Yeah. So there is a way to be eating salsa that's not that's healthier. So and sometimes I do make it when I have time, but this is kind of the treat I give myself. Uh, so three more things: sit down when you eat. Try to eat in company, because we tend to eat better. Eat slow, chew, and breathe. And know that change is possible. Know that the healing power of the human body is incredible. If you have diabetes, you can get rid of it. If you have pain in your knees or back pain, you know, if you start eating healthy and you help your body de-inflammate, and get the nutrition that needs to heal itself, it can. The healing power of the body is incredible. And then we have a guest speaker, so I'm gonna skip the questions and ideas, and we're gonna go ahead and invite her to come up and share with us her experience. Thank you, Andre.